Let me ask you this. What makes you happy? What makes you happy? Anybody? What makes you happy? My kids, okay? My dad. My dad. I love you. <laughs> happy. What makes you happy? Music. Music. Food. Food. You know what? Just about 10 minutes ago, my stomach growled. I didn't get my donut this morning. So, Anybody else? What makes you happy? God's love. God's love. Okay. Let me flip this a little bit. What brings you joy? What brings you joy? Children. Children? Relationship with God? A dozen donuts. If one makes me happy, a dozen, huh? What brings you joy? Love. Love? Okay, those are good responses. Someone has one? Oh, my mom? Is that what you're saying? There you go. It's Father's Day. You can't say that. I'm sorry. Moms, you know, it kills me. You mothers, you get everything. You even steal our Father's Day from us, right? <laughs> I don't know about your house, but my house is a big deal on Mother's Day. Nothing for fun. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Do you know there's a difference between joy and happiness? Do you know that? Let me tell you a little bit about the difference between joy and happiness. Let me illustrate it to you, okay? We're going to put some pictures up here. See, happiness is contingent on outside factors. Happiness is contingent on outside factors. Like this. Ice cream makes me happy. Carrots, not so much. I don't know how you people can eat carrots. Ugh, disgusting. Owning a motorcycle would make me happy. The fact that I don't have the money to own that motorcycle kind of bums me out. But joy is deeper than happiness. Joy lasts longer than the moment. It's what lasts when the source of that joy or the source of that happiness is gone. Let me illustrate it a little bit more for you. The love that I receive from my wife and my kids brings me joy. Even if something, God forbid, happened to them, their love would always bring me joy. I'm happy when we're together. That's happiness. They still bring me joy even when they're not with me. Let's be honest, parents, sometimes they bring me even more joy when they're not. No, I'm kidding. Now, Paul writes a letter to the church in Philippi. It's called the letter to the Philippians. And you may have read through Philippians. And for the next 10 weeks, we're going to look at this letter. And what I want you to get right from the beginning is that Paul is in jail in Rome when he writes this letter to the Philippian church. And yet he writes this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. He's not in one of our American prisons, right? Where they have cable TV and they have good beds, and right? He's in a prison in Rome that was dirty and nasty and gross. And he's probably chained to a wall, at least at some parts during the day. We're not exactly sure. We know that at a certain point when he was in Rome, he was able to be in his own home. But he was under house arrest. We're not exactly sure all the details at exactly the moment in which he writes this, but we do know that he's in prison. We do know that Paul is writing this from a perspective that he shouldn't be talking about joy. And yet he writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, he says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Everybody say that word with me, rejoice. Rejoice. Now, come on, a little better than that. Always, and again I say, Rejoice. I'm in prison and I'm telling you, things are good. Rejoice. Paul said those words, as I said, while he was in prison. And that's why we're going to call this series A Rebel's Guide to Joy. Despite everything Paul faced, despite the obstacles and the setbacks in his life, 
Even though they could take his freedom, even though they could take his ability to get around, despite loneliness, poverty, conflict, anxiety, obstacles, inner and outer, they couldn't take his joy because his joy was rooted in something greater and deeper than what was happening around him. And that's how he rebelled. Take everything from me, and guess what? I'm still going to have joy. My hope through this series, my hope is that over these next few weeks, is that no matter what you face, you'll always have joy. So we're going to talk about different things over these next couple of weeks. We're going to talk about joy while you're lonely. We're going to talk about joy in temptation. We're going to talk about joy in all kinds of problem areas of your life. And we're going to talk about how God is greater than your circumstances. And that when you tap into the source of joy, no matter what occurs in your life, you could say as Paul did, Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Sound good? Yeah. So let's take a look at this today. We're going to talk about odd beginnings. Look at the person next to you and say, you're odd. And the person on the other side of you say, he's odd. Or she's odd, right? <laughs> so what is this book of Philippians about? At the very heart of it, the book of Philippians is about spiritual maturity. And I like the book of Philippians. It's one of my favorite books. It's short, it's concise, it gets to the point. But at the heart of it, it's about being grown up in your spiritual life. It's for people who are Christ followers who are either mature already or who are serious about maturing in their faith. Philippians, listen to this, is the only letter of Paul's that doesn't address the issue. Some people read 1 Corinthians, it cracks me up. 1 Corinthians, I want you sometime to read 1 Corinthians from the perspective in which it was really written. The perspective in which 1 Corinthians was really written, Paul was ticked off. It's one of those really, you know, have you ever sat down and you wrote a letter and you're like, oh man, and at the end of it you go, I, I shouldn't send that. Like to your boss or to your husband or wife, or right? Well, Paul sits down, writes that letter, and sends it. That's what 1 Corinthians is. 2 Corinthians is, oh, wait up, I was kind of harsh on you guys. Um, <laughs> you are doing a couple things right. At the same time, here's a couple other things you should be fixing. That's not what Philippians is. Philippians is Paul connecting with people he really loves. Paul is connecting with people who are growing in their faith. Paul is saying, you guys have got this right. You guys are doing a good job. And I want to commend you. That's Philippians. Now, to understand this letter, we need to go back and we need to see kind of the origins of the church in Philippi. Oh, let me stop for just a second and just say a big shout out to Italy, who won yesterday. Huh? Vinny? You don't know? You know. <laughs> I knew these guys, Daniela put out that she was nervous before the game, and they won, huh? Very good, okay. So Paul's a church planner, we know that. Paul goes to major cities around the world at that time, and he begins to talk to people. He goes to, usually he would go to the Jewish synagogue, and he'd be kind of work out from the synagogue, and, and from there he'd meet people and talk to them and and discuss with them the differences between Judaism and Christianity and how Christ fulfilled the law and so on and so forth. And he finds himself in this town in Philippi. And he begins to plant a church. He begins to start a church from scratch. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, he's writing back to the Philippians now. I'm sorry? Oh, they're... I heard an echo. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Here we go. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi. If I were to leave and I was to write a letter back to the people in Brantford, wouldn't it be nice to get a letter to all the holy people in Brantford? Pretty neat. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, including the elders, the deacons, may God our Father 
And the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Now, who are these holy people? You, you look at this, and it's easy for us to read the Bible and just kind of skip over and miss some of the nuances in a book. And we hear this, all the holy people in Philippi. Who are these holy people? Who is he talking about? Do we really know who they are? Well, the truth is, we do have an idea of some of the people that Paul is writing to in Philippi. So, we're going to take a look today at three people that Paul won to the Lord while he was in Philippi. To do that, we're going to leave Philippians today, and we're going to go to the book of Acts. We're going to go to Acts chapter 16. And we're going to meet three people, three very diverse, three very different people from Philippi. In your notes, if you have your notes with you, and can I, I also want to put a little plug in here. If you have your smartphone, it's a lot of fun. You can email it to yourself, the notes. On the back of your bulletin, it has all the instructions on how you can connect with Shoreline Community Church and put your notes in right along. And it also has the verses and everything there. We also put a little bit of a different spin in the, uh, in the smartphone. So if you're tech savvy and you like doing that, I really highly suggest that to you. And what's neat, at the very end of it, put the notes in and just hit send and it'll go to your email account. And uh, you don't have to fill everything in and try and remember it. But in your notes, the first person that Paul talks about, or the first person we see from Philippi, is a woman named Lydia. The first person is Lydia. Hi, Lydia. Starting in verse 11, Acts chapter 16, verse 11, it says this, We boarded the boat at Troas, sailed straight across to the island of Samothrace, and the next day we landed at Neapolis. From there we reached Philippi, a major city of that district of Macedonia and a Roman colony, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer, and we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. Now, right there, I want you to kind of think of a Beth Moore Bible study for ladies, okay? A bunch of ladies, they're out, they're having their Beth Moore Bible study. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshiped God, and as she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart. She accepted what Paul was saying, she was baptized along with the other members of her household when she asked us to be her guest. If you agree that I am a true believer in the Lord, she said, come, stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. Now, Lydia is Asian. She's from Thyatira. And her house is in Philippi. Think about that for a moment. Which means Lydia has money. All the guys said, oh, I'd like to meet Lydia, right? All the single guys, a woman who takes care of herself, a woman who can make her own money, a woman of means all by herself. Lydia is a wealthy woman. She's from Asia. She has a second home. She's, she's kind of, I want you to think of her this way. She's a CEO. She's kind of a fastinista. She's, you know, she's one of those women. To have two homes means she had considerable wealth, as I said. In our day, Lydia probably had a private jet. And she flew, she would fly from New York to L.A. and back and forth. She'd have homes in both areas. Kind of think of her that way because she had a fashion house that she had to manage. Now, Scripture states that she worshipped God. In other words, Lydia did not believe as many in Thyatira did that there were many gods. In other words, polytheism. She didn't believe in polytheism. She was interested in the one true God. Instead, she believed in that one God, monotheism. She may have believed, we're not sure. We're not sure if she believed in, in, in Judaism or if she believed in, in a God of wind, of rain, a God of fashion, a God of... We don't know exactly what that one God was, but we do know this. She was a seeker. She wanted to know the truth. Scripture notes that she listened and right away, she, and once she heard the word, she got busy trying to live a good life. In other words, when she made a decision for Christ, she was all in. She's intellectual. As I said, she's a seeker. And along with some other women, she's at her Beth Moore Bible study there, and she's listening intently. And, and Paul walks in, and Paul kind of turns the DVD off and says, you know what she's talking about here? Let me explain it to you. Let me expound on it. Let me help you 
to understand. <clears throat> she believes in the Torah. She believes in the Ten Commandments. She knows that there's atonement. We're not sure exactly how deeply she believed all of this, but we know that she is searching. And so Paul comes in, as I said, and he helps to make sense. He helps to connect the dots. How many of you can kind of, you, you can really identify with Lydia. There was a point in your life where you had all these questions and it was all kind of out there and they, remember as a kid to connect the dots, right? And when you first look at the picture, you can't really see what the picture is. It just looks like dots. And for some of you, the, the Christian faith was kind of like that connect the dots when it started. You couldn't really tell what, but as you started to connect the dots, all of a sudden the picture came alive to you. Another way to look at it, how many of you are really good at those like squiggly pictures where you have to, you know, do your eyes just the right way and then there's something within it? I saw the first one ever in my life two weeks ago. No, I'm serious. I can't do it. All of a sudden, one of those things like, oh, oh, I get it. That's what the Christian faith probably was like or, or faith in general was kind of like that for Lydia because she was searching but didn't quite have the answers. Paul comes along and Paul helps her to understand. And it's like the light went on for her. And what does she do? She says, listen, you guys got to come to my house. Paul's like, no, 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 that's okay. No, no, you really got to come to my house. It says that she urged Paul and Silas and Luke, who's writing the book of Acts, to come. So that's the first person. The second person in this story is a slave girl. So we go from a very intellectual seeker, CEO, fastidious, wealthy woman to a slave girl. Acts 16, verses 16 through 19, tells her story. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned her, uh, excuse me, who earned a lot of money for her masters. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Kind of like it when Satan's helping you out, right? Some days it feels like that, doesn't it? This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. I've been trying to do that with my kids for years. <laughs> and instantly, everybody say instantly. instantly. And instantly he left her. Can I, can I stop for just a moment and tell you, you have power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Maybe you didn't get that. You have power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Instantly he left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered, so they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. Isn't it amazing how some people want you to stay bound in chains? They could care less about this girl and her well-being. All they cared about was their wealth. Where Lydia is in control, she's intellectual, she's a seeker, this girl is completely out of control. She's exploited and she's impoverished. Lydia, like I said, was a seeker. This little girl doesn't know the scriptures. She's following them, screaming. This girl's being disruptive. And here's what God does. He doesn't appeal to her, he doesn't appeal to her intellect. See, here's the problem we have a lot of times. Can I tell you something in the church? We think we have a one-size-fits-all message of the cross, right? How many of you remember the Romans Road? And we go and we talk to somebody about the Romans of the road, and they're like, I don't care. My life's a mess. I couldn't care about some road over in Rome or some Bible. I couldn't care less. All I know is my life's a mess. And this girl, Paul doesn't sit down and say to her, now listen, you know, I was just at a Beth Moore uh, Bible study, and I want to explain to you some of the principles that I learned over the Beth Moore Bible study. I think these will really change your life. It doesn't appeal to her intellect. Instead, he commands the demon to come out of her. In other words, he demonstrates or he introduces her to the power of God. And her life is changed. And she becomes aware of Christ's power and she's set free and she's saved. Like I said, Lydia is touched 
through her intellect. The slave girl is reached through an undeniable act of power. Listen, no matter what happened, this girl is going to say for the rest of her life, all I know is one day I was a mess. My life was crazy. You can't imagine what I was like. And this man, Paul, he spoke to me in the name and the power of Jesus Christ, and I was set free. You can say whatever you want about God. You can say whatever you want about religion. You can say whatever you want about this Christianity thing. All I know is my life was changed. It's undeniable, and I can't, I can't speak against it. You couldn't script two more opposite people to start a church with, could you? One's rich, intellectual, measured, and the second one's a slave, completely out of control, whose life is a mess. See, here's the deal. In the church world, we love the Lydia's, don't we? We love the rich, powerful, all-together people. And we say, oh, we want to fill our churches up with them. But the slave girl, we're like, listen, come back to us, you know, when you got everything straightened out. Come back to us when your life isn't a mess anymore. Come back when you don't embarrass us anymore. Because you know what? We've got to tell everybody else, the slave girl's part of our church too. I didn't get an amen there. Then there's person number three. Person number three is a prison guard. Where did we leave the story? They dragged Paul and Silas off to the authorities, right? Verse 20, here's what happens. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews. They shouted to the city officials. These are the men that, he, that had enslaved this girl, and they're talking to the city officials now. They're teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. And a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. Boy, they're having a bad, their day just went bad, didn't it? They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was ordered to make sure that they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. This is a long night, isn't it? Because they're singing at midnight, and all this is happening after midnight. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. The next morning, like the next morning, like now, right? I love how it says the next morning, like right now. The city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, let those men go. So the jailer told Paul, the city officials have said, you and Silas are free to leave. Go in peace. I want, I want you to notice what the crowd says, right? The crowd calls Paul and his followers, these Jews. Right? They pull out the race card right from the beginning. These outsiders, these Jews, these foreigners. And then they had them beaten, imprisoned, chained to the wall, and the jailer was ordered to keep them safe. In other words, they were put in the inner, inner, inner part of the jail. And then they chained them to the wall. Why? Because they knew the rioters would come and get them in the middle of the night. This is like, you, you remember the old Wild Wild West movies? John Wayne and the different ones, they're in the, they're in the jail. You know, they're keeping that guy who's got a... He's, they, they're, they're so honor-bound that they got to keep them safe so they can be hung later on because they don't want the, the rioters to come. That's kind of what the scene is here in Philippi when Paul and Silas are dragged in to the jail. There's these rioters out there, and they want to drag them off and kill them right now. And the jailer says, me and the boys. You, you should be saying this, right? We're fixing to shoot us some people. <laughs> They're loaded, they're, they, they're in lockdown, and they've got Paul and Silas all the way in the middle of the jail, so it's hardest to get to them. 
and they chained him to the wall. And what did Paul and Silas do? Oh, man, we just love Jesus so much. All we want to do is this. Why does he let everything happen to me? <laughs> Come on, that's what you'd be doing. That's what I'd be doing. I just serve God. And he just he never, anything goes right. <laughs> I don't even know if I should keep doing this anymore. <laughs> right? Come on, be honest with yourself for a moment. That's exactly what you'd be doing. Now, Paul and Silas, they start singing a song. I don't know what song it is, you know. Maybe they start singing Amazing Grace. Down there in the jail cell. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Right? Maybe someone else, another person knew that song. They begin to sing it. Right there from the innermost part of that jail. God shows up. God shows up, first of all, in two men's lives who'd been serving him but didn't go the way they thought it should go. You know, don't we have this idea that when we do something for God, God owes us? Right? Well, I put my $10 in the offering. I, I, God should be showing up with some money for me. I went to church, so my, my kids should be healthy and strong and you know we should get everything god god santa claus isn't he if i do then i get and listen god promises that he'll take care of our needs it doesn't say anything about our wants folks he'll take care of our needs and let me tell you something else god doesn't always pay in cash thank god he doesn't right we think we put a 10 in, we should get 100 back. And God says, man, when's the last time your car broke down? Thank you, Lord. Because that pile of bolts, man, it's just holding on. God doesn't always pay in cash, and I'm grateful for it. How about you? So there they are. They're in the prison. Paul's crazy. I love this guy. Later on, other book of the Bible says, I don't brag about the good things. I brag about my weaknesses. Because when I'm weak, he's made strong. I've been beaten. I've been shipwrecked. I've been abandoned. I've been rich. I've been poor. I boasted my weaknesses. Paul's crazy. Hey, Silas, I heard this new song, man. Is your shoulder out of joint? Yeah, mine is too. <laughs> it hurts. We, we got to sing the song. Yeah, it's like midnight, man. I was going to go sleep. Nah, come on. We got to sing. This is singing time of the night. You know what you do when you're in prison, Silas? Because I'm always here, bro. We got to sing us a song. Okay, Paul. You, you know you're crazy, right? No, we got to sing. Paul begins to sing. Silas begins to sing. Right there in the inner chamber. Catch this. The jailer isn't like the first two women. He's not like Lydia. And he's not like the slave girl. This guy, he's a blue-collar, ex-military. He's a hard man. You don't get to be the jailer. They don't just, like, take a vote and you get to be the jailer. They pick the guy who's tough in these Roman prisons. They pick the guy who can get the job done. Because here's the deal. If someone breaks out of the jail, guess who gets killed? If someone breaks out, it's the jailer's life for it. So they pick a guy who can keep them there. This guy isn't interested in politics. He isn't interested in religion. He's not looking for anything. He just wants to go home, watch the World Cup, and grab a beer. That's all he cares about. He probably has never really thought about eternity or the condition of his soul or where he would spend eternity. He was just your everyday, middle-class, working Joe. So how does God reach him? Well, as I said, if they broke out of jail... It was his life. Now, I want you to catch something. It says that when he gets, he wakes up, he probably lived right there. He had other guards and stuff around them. He's the, he's the head guy. So he wakes up, he sees everybody, and he grabs his sword. He's about to kill himself. Now, this is my speculation. This is the gospel according to Paul Allen, not the apostle Paul. But I don't think he's ready to kill himself out of fear. I think this is the type of guy who's ready to kill himself out of duty, out of loyalty, 
He says, you know what? These guys left on my watch because he's not waiting for a trial. He's not waiting for all the facts. He doesn't even go looking to see if they're all there. The doors are open. They, gotta, they had to have left. I wouldn't stay. So before he even has the facts, this guy says, you know what? I'm duty bound. I failed. I messed up. This happened on my watch. I'm going to take my life. And then he hears Paul's voice. Hey, 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 settle down, settle down, man. We're right here. Chill out, chill out. Nobody left. Get the facts. We're right here. And I love what the jailer does. He just runs out and says, how do I get saved? How do I get saved? How do I serve a God who would do this for you? Because this God with this much power that's someone I want to be a part of. That's something I want to join. That's something I want to be a part of. Paul doesn't appeal to his intellect as he did to Lydia. And Paul doesn't demonstrate God's power. Paul instead appeals to him by inviting him to a higher calling. Paul demonstrates godliness by staying and he ministers to the jailer and eventually to his family. And this is the beginning of the church in Philippi. This is the nucleus for this church in Philippi that we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. So let me recap this for you for just a moment. First of all, we have the wealthy Fastenisa and Lydia. Secondly, we have this crazed slave girl. And then we have a blue-collar jailer. This is who Paul starts the Philippian church with. When Philippians is written, and we don't know what has happened or how long it's been since Paul was in Philippi, we do know that Paul has a very deep love for these people because when he writes them, he says that he can't wait to see them. We also know that the church in Philippi was diverse. It wasn't just a church for ex-GIs or, or ex-slave girls or, or wealthy CEOs. The gospel had literally, think about this, created a new community, a community of acceptance and love where it didn't matter where you came from or what your past looked like, you were welcome. It's a great picture of what our church should look like, isn't it? They had foreigners in Lydia being there from Asia. It was diverse. This is how the church should function. Over the next weeks, we're going to look at what joy looks like in diverse situations. Paul declares in Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, I have learned to be content in every situation. In other words, I have joy no matter what. Over these next weeks, we're going to unpack what this means. And I promise that you're not going to want to miss one week of this series. As a matter of fact, let me give you a heads up. Next week, we're going to talk about joy in loneliness. I hope you'll join us. So here's what I'm asking you to do this week. In your notes, everybody should have them. In your notes, there's a I will part of your notes. If you're following along on your smartphone, you'll find it there as well. And you can put one, two, three. You can put one or three or whatever. You can put one in there. All. But here's what I'm asking you to do this week. First of all, I'm asking you to read the whole book of Philippians. It's four chapters. Then I'm asking you to pray every day that God will reveal himself to you as you read. God, would you make these pages come alive? Let me see you in these scriptures. Let me see me as it relates to these scriptures. And now I'm asking you to memorize Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. I have learned to be content in all situations. Is it up there, hon? We put that up there for me? Why don't you say that with me? I have learned to be content in all situations. Isn't that a great way to live? No matter what comes my way, no matter the problems, the highs, the lows, the goods, the bads, I've learned to be content. I've learned to have joy in all situations.